Hello there. Let's do network address translation because you're going to need it to go online. So the reason why we need NAT is because we tend to use private IP networks in our LANs. Networks like the 10 network, the 172.16 through to 172.31, and the 192.168.0 through to 192.168.255 networks. The thing is, these networks are private, which means anybody and everybody can use them, as we discussed in a previous video in IPv4. Now, the problem with those private addresses is that they're not unique or routable on the internet. So let's see what it was like before NAT was a thing. So we'll have the internet, and then we'll have you sitting at home on your network, and then there'll be me sitting at home on my network. And by a sheer bit of coincidence, you and I have the same small office home office router, which means our DHCP server probably works the same, and we both landed up with the same private IP address, 192.168.0.100. Now we're both going to go onto the internet. You're going to be a diligent learner going to www.comptia.org, which at the moment when I record this video is 104.18.35.29. And me, well, I'm wasting time. I'm screwing around on thisiswhyimbroke.com which at the time of the recording is 104.26.6.171 for its public IP address. Now we're both going online at the same time. So we're both generating an HTTP request. Your source IP is 192.168.0.100, just like mine. The destination IP for your request in orange is 104.18.35.29, whereas mine is going to 104.26.6.171. Now, off go our requests to the respective web servers. And when those requests arrive, well, obviously these web servers are going to reply to us. So to reply to us, they are going to start creating HTTP responses, which means source and destination IP addresses swap around. Now, the destination IP address for the response from CompTIA is 192.168.0.100. And the destination IP address for the response from thisiswhyimbroke.com is 192.168.0.100, which means that you're possibly going to land up with my response and I'm possibly going to land up with your response, which is obviously not what we were hoping for. I think at least one of us is going to be very confused about the response that we get. So this is something that we obviously don't want. So let's check out what is NAT going to do for us. Well, first of all, NAT is able to run on any layer 3 device, whether it be a router, a firewall, or a server that we set up to do NAT translation. And what it'll do is it will take a public IP address that we get through our ISP, and it will translate for us. Now this public IP address can either be the one that is allocated to your router's public interface, or it could be an additional IP address that you lease from your ISP. And you just have to get the ISP to make sure that the traffic routes back to whatever IP address is on your router. And as I said, NAT is going to swap the IP addresses. It will swap the public IP address when the packets go out from the LAN to the WAN and swap it back again for the responses coming in. So let's try again. But this time, we're going to run NAT on our routers. And your ISP is going to give you 155.93.89.163. If your ISP actually did give you that IP address, I am that good. If it's not your public IP address, well, I picked it sort of randomly. And then my public IP address is 212.774.170. Now, we're both going to generate our requests to go online. So your packet makes its way from your computer to your router, and so does mine. Now the HTTP requests are on the routers. The NAT service on your router and my router goes, no, 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 no. We can't let this packet onto the public infrastructure with those 192.168.0.100 addresses. So they're going to remove those private source IP addresses. And your router's NAT service will impose 155.93.89.163 and mine imposes 212.774.170 for the source IP addresses. And obviously both your router and my router will remember having done this translation for 192.168.0.100 to the relevant public IP addresses. Now our routers can comfortably forward those requests onto the internet and they make their way to the relevant web servers. Now obviously they want to generate their responses to us 
which means everything's going to swap around. Source IP is obviously the web server's IP addresses, and then the destination IP address for the CompTIA response is 155938963, which is your public IP address. And the destination IP for my response is 212.77.4.170. And those responses make their way back. Now that those responses are back, the NAT servers on your router and my router both know that they did a translation and they know they're not the ones that ask for the websites. So they're going to clear out their IP addresses from the destination field and put the 192.168.0.100 addresses back in. And then let them into the LAN, which means you get the response you wanted and I get the response I wanted and no problems occurred. Now the process that we've just looked at very accurately describes two variations of NAT. Static NAT and dynamic NAT. Now with static NAT and dynamic NAT, we're going to quickly compare the differences. So with static NAT, it's a one-to-one -one translation, which means one private IP address to one public IP address. Okay, that sort of makes sense. But when we say one-to-one, -one, we also mean one command per translation. So if I've got two people to translate, fantastic, it's two commands on a small office, small business enterprise router. But if I've got 100 people or 1,000 people, it's 100 or 1,000 commands, respectively. So we generally use this when we have hosts that need to go online with specific IP addresses. Whereas with Dynamic NAT, the translation allows us to go with one or a group to one or a group. So bear with me here, but it's going to be able to do one or a group of private people to one or a group of public addresses. Now, it's going to be several commands to do this all. But whether I'm translating for 10 people, 100 or 1,000, it's going to be the same amount of commands, more or less. And this makes it suitable for doing whole LAN segments. But both static and dynamic are not perfect. They have one big limitation. And that is, while one person is getting translated to a particular public IP address, that public IP address is unavailable for others to use which can lead to contention issues where we might have too many users trying to use too few public IP addresses. And NAT does not have any sort of scheduling for fairness. Now, a way around this is you could go and get more public IP addresses from your ISP, but that does cost money. One of the things that you pay your ISP for, besides the internet access and the speed and all that good stuff, is you are paying them for the allocation of at least one public IP address, maybe more and it does cost a pretty penny sometimes. So we have port address translation, also known as network address port translation, or NAT overload as the solution. So let's understand the cool option that many people tend to use. NAT goes by a couple names, port address translation, network address port translation, and NAT overload, which sounds really cool, but it's the same thing regardless of which name you use. And what's gonna happen is, the router will track the port numbers in addition to the IP addresses. Now the focus will be on the port number that we use as a session ID. Now we haven't really looked at this characteristic of how we track sessions, so let's quickly do that. So for port numbers used as session tracking identifiers, let's have a client and a web server. The client is going to make an HTTP request. The destination port number will be 443 for HTTPS and the source port will be 1141 because I decided that. Well, I actually chose it at random. You see, the thing is, when we make a request to a web server, we're saying, hey, I want to speak to the service that is behind port number 443, whether it be Microsoft's IIS, Apache, Nginx, or any other web server application. They would all respond to requests on that port number. The source port is used by the client as a session identifier so that we can keep all the different activities in different browser tabs separated from one another. And it's chosen at random and then agreed upon by the web server, in case somebody else is already using that to identify their session with a web server. Then the web server is going to respond to us. And the destination port will be 1141 and the source port will be 443, which makes sense. It's the web server replying to that particular session that probably aligns with a tab in your browser on your computer. So it's replying to that session. Whereas the source port number is identifying who is replying in this case, which is the web service. And as the client, you're not really phased whether it's a Windows server or a Linux server. 
whether it's using IIS, Apache, Nginx, or any other web service that you could possibly be running on the server. You just care that you get your website. Now, this means that we could use that source port in the request and destination port in the reply to differentiate between two different people using the same public IP address when it comes to network address translation. So let's see this kick off in a PAT example. So we're going to have the internet and CompTIA again and then a website called Netflix because it's like Netflix but it's not Netflix. And they're on 104.18.35.29 for CompTIA and 199.60.103.31 for Netflix. You are in your home, on your network, but so is somebody else. You can be the red PC and somebody else can be the blue PC. And you're both sitting online with private IP addresses on the LAN. 192.168.0.100 for you and 192.168.0.101 for the person in blue. And you've still got the public IP address 155.93.89.163. And this time we're running PAT on the router which means your HTTP request is a little bit more involved. You've got your destination IP address of 104.18.35.29, source IP 192.168.0.100, destination port 443, source port your computer randomly chose as 555. The person who is going to Netflix is going to 199.60.103.31, source IP 192.168.0.101, and destination port 443, source port 9713. Cool. So at least the source ports are different. Off go the requests to the default gateway, which is your home router. And because your home router is running port address translation, it's going to run a PAT table to keep track of which port number aligns with which private IP address. So it populates a little PAT table that says triple five is equal to 192.168.0.100 U. And 9713 is equal to 192.168.0.101, which is the person in blue. Now, if you and somebody else on the LAN happen to choose the same source port number uh, more or less at the same time, whoever's packet got in first to the router would probably get to use that source port. And the second person who might be using the same source port number would be told by the home router, please try again and use a different one. So you might get maybe one packet's delay. Now that that's been done, both your packet in orange and the other person in blue can have their source IP addresses stripped out and the home router will inject 155.9389.163 as the source IP for both packets. Both packets make their way onto the internet and go to their respective web servers. And now the requests are where they need to be at. But obviously we're going to generate responses and as we know everything swaps around. Destination IP is now 155.9389.163 for both responses. Destination port 555 for the orange response and 9713 for the blue response. Source port 443. It's the web services responding to both you and that other person. The responses now make their way back to the home router. And the home router is able to tell which private source IP address made the original request because it kept track of the port number. For your request for CompTIA, it was source port 555. So when that response comes back and the home router sees it in the destination port, it goes, ah, 555. That was for 192.168.0.100. And for the other person, 9713 sees, ah, they are 192.168.0.101. So now it can strip out the destination IP addresses from those fields put in the correct private ones and those private responses can now come back onto the LAN nice and smoothly. And that is how network address and port address translation works. It tends to get used quite widely in most home networks, especially port address translation. Most small office home office routers run this by default. And you know what? I would still favor PAT for many businesses because you can get away with way fewer public IP addresses keeping your internet costs as low as possible. But that is all I have to tell you about NAT for now. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And if you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to do that. And while we're on that, if you have any friends, family members, colleagues, peers, or anybody you know that wants to do Network Plus and you think this would help them, don't be afraid to share this stuff with them. Otherwise, though, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I will catch you in the next video.